tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is brought to you by Fume Air Devices. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. This episode is also brought to you by I Hear Fear on Wondering. Join host Carrie Mulligan on a journey through stories so strange, so unusual, you won't believe that they're all true. From forest disappearances to murderous dance floors, I recommend it for a frightful time. Follow I Hear Fear on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcast. You can binge all episodes of I Hear Fear ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. And finally, this episode is also brought to you by Mint Mobile. Don't throw your money away on big-name phone companies. Get unlimited talk, text, and high-speed 5G data for just $15 a month. Start saving today. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just $15 a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to $15 a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well... I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 13, Episode 23. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Dale Thompson. Tonight, we'll hear stories of contests and catastrophes, doctors and disasters, fingers of fear... Hearing of Horrors. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail... So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> You've won. Fantastic. The grand prize is yours. Now all you need to do is enjoy that vacation you've earned. Of course, while in some instances it's the prize itself that proves too good to be true... This time, it's more about the journey than the destination. If one can ever get there, that is. Without further ado, I present to you, Dead is Dead. Mm. 
Winning an all-expenses-paid trip without any catches is quite rare from my experience. There's something unfamiliar with awards, triumphs, and real success for most adults. Take winning the lottery, for instance. How much money does a person sink into that abyss of no return just to win a free couple of lines in the next draw? When you add it up, gambling and gambling addicts are just trying to break even. Even in my experience, and I'm no expert, I've found it nearly impossible. But as fate would have it, profiting or balancing the account when it came to sweepstakes, contests, or raffles hardly produced a stroke of fortune. Another example might be the old office pool, where everyone puts some money in during something like the NCAA Sweet 16 basketball tournament, and then, by chance, only one person in the office wins or loses, according to who, in the end, is crowned the champs of college basketball season. Sweet 16. Now, there is a phrase as un-PC in our current climate and things you can say and do. But you get my point, right? Well, now, there's always the exception and the exclusion, of course, in that somebody always wins. What's the slogan? If you don't play, you cannot win, or gotta be in it to win it? Mark Sweeney was literally over the moon. Life had been a crapshoot for him. He'd never won a single thing in his entire life. The main cause of never winning is he never gambled. He wouldn't even bet on a sure thing. Yet this one time, he filled out a sweepstakes form online to win an all-exclusive paid trip to a marvelous holiday resort. And he had won. Most certainly the luck of the draw, as they say. He couldn't be more thrilled. Plus, he had plenty of accumulated annual leave time built up from work that he could take it. The company he worked for had already sent out a notice to all employees to take their annual leave before Christmas, if at all possible. They didn't want the leave to build up from weeks to months. Mark put in for his holidays at work, which were immediately approved, and he told no one what his plans were. He simply said, I'm going to be away for a couple of weeks, so I'll see you when I see you. The trip to this holiday destination began with a flight on a 757 jet directly to the Vail Eagle Airport, where a car rental was waiting for him in his name. Mark thought, oh, this is too good to be true. He hadn't won the Megabucks lottery, but he had won, and this was going to be, more than likely, a once-in-a-lifetime vacation. He paid a little extra and upgraded the vehicle to a sportier model. He was informed that it shouldn't take more than 30 minutes to make the drive from the airport to Beaver Creek. All he needed to do was head east on I-70. All loaded up and situated in his rental, off he drove. He rolled down the window to breathe that fresh mountain air of Colorado. It was clean, refreshing, and he sucked it in like therapy. His flight had gotten in late, and the sun was sinking like a ship. Not bothered by the lack of sunlight, Mark decided to jump off the interstate and ended up on Highway 6, which was a bit closer to Eagle River. He was glad this trip was happening before snow season. He wasn't experienced with winter driving. The sports car Mark had rented was quite zippy, and he was having a great time flinging himself around the curves and sharp corners. Of course, he should have known better, but he wasn't considering the risk of throwing the dice, and his driving was becoming foolhardy at best. He loved the feel of this car, the way it stayed glued to the road. He was now drifting as if the traffic laws didn't apply to him, and never considered once that there might be a state police or sheriff's deputy just waiting for some reckless nitwit barreling through injudiciously with acute hubristic instincts. Mark was really laying into this unfamiliar, sinuous stretch of road. Tires were howling as he flew into the sharpest bend yet. Mark realized the instant he was in the tightest twist of the road that the traction beneath him wasn't holding. Matter of fact, it gave way at an unreasonable speed. The car, with Mark strapped tightly in it, did a tumble, a rollover, flipping more than three times. The squawking tires sang no more, but Mark was filling the car with his own screams. There was severe momentum where metal and plastic were folded and bent, and Mark was captured helplessly in the twilight of the moment. The 
Ragdoll being tossed down a flight of stairs, Mark's arms flailed in a twisted and perverted show of animation. As he was contorted in natural ways, completely at the mercy of Newton's law of motion, force equals Newtons equals pounds equals tons, he told himself, this is gonna hurt. The car ceased its violent tumble and miraculously landed it right side up. The car was munted, absolutely demolished. Mark heard a hissing sound coming from steam pouring from the radiator, and the horn seemed to be stuck in muffled klaxon mode as if something was covering it. Mark unfastened his seatbelt and crawled from the window of the demolished metal. He did a once-over, palpitating his body, searching for anything broken, but as fate would have it, he was in one piece and surprisingly not hurt at all. He picked up one of the door mirrors that had broken in the crash and examined his face. There was not a scratch or even an abrasion to be found. He immediately thanked God for coming through this unscathed. Hallelujah, he shouted out loud. What a stroke of luck, he thought as he searched for his cell phone. Uh, This was just great, not lucky enough. He could not see his phone anywhere. Smashing the rental car was going to raise his automobile insurance rate, and now his cell phone was missing. After a disappointing search, he decided, since he was losing daylight, grab a bag of essentials and head back up to the road, hoping to hitch a ride from a passerby, and he could return in the morning daylight to locate his phone. His bag was fairly heavy, and he found himself struggling along the road without a single car in sight. He watched carefully for a sign of a pair of headlights heading his way. He didn't care from which direction they came, he just wanted off the road. He walked a good way and was about to take a seat on his luggage when up ahead in the distance he saw a light. Saved, he vocalized, just realizing how scratchy his throat was. He was now desperate for something to drink. This tickling sensation in the back of his throat caused him a slight cough, but he proceeded on being drawn to the light. The house appeared to have a single window let up, which was evidence of a possible resident being home. As he drew nearer to the house, he took note of how shabby, dilapidated, and run down the place presented itself. A cold chill raced over him as if winter had breathed upon him. He knew before night plunged completely into darkness that he needed shelter, and regardless of the miserable state of the house, he had to take a chance and more time to tempt fate. He hoped the turn of events, meaning the car accident, and him surviving it without a scratch, was not his last miracle of the night. Mark stepped onto the wooden porch. Flooring felt soft, rotted spongy. He wrapped a few solid bangs in the door with his knuckles and waited in anticipation of being greeted. He heard the stirring of someone inside responding. The door soon cracked open with a squeak. The young boy answered the door. He was in his pajamas. Mark guessed his age to be eleven or twelve years old. Mark had expected an adult, but the boy would do. Good evening, young fella. My name's Mark Sweeney. And I've been in an automobile accident. Would you happen to have a telephone I might use to call for a taxi? Mark asked. The homely boy with the red tussled hair stood dumbly, eyes fixed queerly upon Mark's face. Ain't got no phone, mister. The boy obviously had learning disabilities, Mark assumed, and he asked further, Is your mother or father home that I might speak to one of them and possibly giving me a ride to Beaver Creek? The boy looked stiff, sadly lethargic. His nail beds were grimy and black, as if he had just recently clawed his way out of a grave. He answered with, I got no mother or father, but I had a ma and pa, and they're both dead. This troubled Mark deeply. For whatever reason, his stomach churned like a maelstrom and cramped as if he had suddenly been punched in the gut. Being submerged in this uncomfortable position, with Mark knowing that the boy could not possibly live here alone, asked, Is there anyone else here that might help me? Do you happen to know of any adult who has a car and can drive? Mark glanced around at the driveway, not realizing until now there was no car in the drive. He swore under his breath, trying to mentally fight off the stomach cramps. My sister, 
I live here with my sister, but she's not here right now, the boy said drearily. Mark introduced himself a second time. I'm Mark. What's your name? I'm called Buck. Again, this apathetic child was either missing a few marbles in the social category or he was on some really good opiates. Hey, Buck, how about you let me go to the toilet? If you would be so kind, I'm really not comfortable with going out there in the woods, Mark said. Sure thing. You might not want to be outside tonight anyhow. Clement weather is moving in, the weatherman said. Buck opened the door back further, and the unoiled rusty hinges sang with a note of rapid oscillation similar to that of a minuet. Inside the house, with the door closed behind them, Mark found himself in some kind of throwback to early civilization. The room was amazingly spacious, which amplified the clumping of Mark's boots resounding with reverberations echoing from floor to ceiling. It's acoustics. Mark took note of the taxidermy, which he had a degree of aversion to. Mark was an animal lover, and this didn't strike right with him, though he was grateful for the hospitality. The other peculiar thing was there was no electricity that he could discern. The room was lit with a few candles, which were burning bright and guttering down, plus one lamp, which Buck had retrieved from a ceiling hook, and was now using as the guide down a hallway where the toilet was found. Mark was over the moon to be out of the harsh elements. Buck handed him the lantern without a word and left Mark to conduct his business. As he stood over the toilet, attempting to relieve himself, he realized he no longer needed to go. He noticed a fair bit of dust and cobwebs, as if this toilet area was seldom, if ever, used or cleaned once in a while. He was glad he had minimal light. If the house was such a ruin in the dark, he could only imagine what the illumination would reveal. He gave up on the attempt to empty his bladder. As a matter of fact, his stomach came around as well, and he soon proceeded back into the main room where Buck was dutifully standing. You wouldn't happen to have a phone, would you? Mark queried again. Got no use for a phone. Ain't nobody to call. Mark thought it inexplicable that a house would have no way of communicating but to each other. So, Buck, is there a power shortage, or have you guys had your electricity off? Mark inquired. Ain't no electricity in a good month of Sundays. One day we had it, next day nothing. We get by, though. One day you're living, and the next day you die. Ma and Pa both died, Buck somberly said. I don't mean to pry, but how did they die? Mark's curiosity of this backward scenario had risen to the surface. Before Buck answered, there was a meowing of a cat, and Mark looked down in the dim light of the shadowy floor and felt the brush of a cat against his ankle. Oh, you have a cat, Mark stated the obvious, surprised. It's Edith's cat, Buck informed him. Does it have a name? Mark reached down and stroked its soft fur as it purred, still circling his ankle. Yes, sir. That's familiar, Buck answered. What an odd name, Mark thought. Then, on the other hand, the day had morphed into a peculiarity that caused him an uneasiness. There's something not right. Langmer in the air he just couldn't describe. I don't know when Edith, my sister, is going to return. You ought to stay here tonight. You don't want to be out there at night. It ain't safe, Buck suggested. Are you saying that only you and your sister live here? Mark couldn't understand this unless Buck's sister was quite a bit older than him. His car wreck was now pushed far back into his mind. He wanted to know more about how these siblings were living. Well, we dwell here. It's home for us. Buck's eyes were still as vacant as when he first opened the door. Mark couldn't get a read on his kid. Mark thought about asking the boy for something to eat or drink, but strangely his thirst and hunger weren't anything he believed he needed to satisfy right away. My bedroom is down the hallway across from Edith's. I would let you sleep in Ma and Pa's room, but Edith said we needed not to disturb it and to keep it as it is. I could you offer you our couch, Buck proffered. Sure, thank you. Couch is fine. I'll be gone early in the morning. I'll find a ride then, 
Maybe Edith will be home by then and she can give me a lift. Mark communicated. Oh, Edith don't drive. Mark said as he walked awkwardly down the hallway to his bedroom where he entered and closed the door without another word. Mark was truly perplexed. A weird little fella, he thought. Mark didn't bother to get undressed. He'd carried with him a sheet for a bed. The thoughts of laying on sheets hundreds of people had slept on had given him the eebie-jeebies. He stretched out the clean white sheet across the couch and laid down, hoping sleep and morning would come quickly. His eyelids were tired because of the hours spent wide awake, but the slumber left him as he wrestled with so many uncertainties in his mind, unable to resolve the perturbations that distracted his rest. His mind was very much active and he spent a good while in rumination with intractable thoughts. The ascendancy of how the rich had it all and the poor had nothing caused him to remain awake for some time. He thought he was just about to doze off when he heard something that startled him into a posture of fright. He listened intently to identify what it was he had heard. There it was again, like something scooting or sliding, shuffling toward the back of the house. He thought better than to wake Buck, who he assumed was surely asleep by now. He decided to investigate this anomaly. After all, Buck was a child in this house and some lunatic might be trying to break in and take advantage. Mark grabbed the lantern and made haste, getting to the kitchen, where he found the back door open. Was it possible someone had already entered the house? He cautiously went to the door and stretched the light out in front of him to see more clearly into the dark. There were impressions in the grass from the door as if something heavy had been dragged away. The grass, obviously, and recently had been mashed down by something of impressive weight. Mark saw nothing within the light's limitations and made the determination it would be foolish to venture out on such a chilly night. Buck wasn't wrong, and clement weather had moved in. It felt like snow, but there was enough moisture in the air that possibly rain might be on its way. Mark returned to the sofa where his mind's overactive thoughts refused him sleep. It then dawned on him he should check on Buck, for what if someone had entered the house? He hurried down the hallway to Buck's bedroom and found the door closed. He staved off any trepidation by reminding himself that Buck was just a boy and was too vulnerable not to peek in to see how he was doing. You know, folks, breaking up is tough. I'm not talking about a relationship, though. I'm talking about your bad habit. You know the one I mean. But one of the things that makes it so tough is that even though you want to get the harmful part out of your life, there are other little habits that are not. And not having those safety lines anymore can make getting away from the bad stuff a lot tougher. But it doesn't have to be that way. Why not make breaking bad habits fun with fume? Fume uses no vapors, no chemicals, no electrical components. It's a breathing device, designed for comfort, style, and to help with fidgeting. It's loaded with little cores of flavored air like orange vanilla and crisp mint. And these cores, if you were to compare to vapors, is more like an herbal tea than a high fructose soda. Clean, refreshing, and enjoyable. And might I recommend one of the more exotic flavors, maple pepper. I think it's time to stop your bad habits. And give yourself something good and positive to help you on your way. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. There was a light beneath the door that he could see. The radiance was red-tinted glow which troubled Mark slightly. Red. 
He thought about desisting, but he knew the right thing to do was to open the door just to crack. It was not his intention to maliciously spy or disturb his sleep or even invade his privacy. It was important to make sure Buck was in no danger. Mark clutched the doorknob in his hand and with some effort twisted it and gently pushed on the door, laying his shoulder against it. Deathly cold air forced its way out across Mark's face. His eyes instantly teared as the frigid temperature of Buck's room escaped. What Mark saw was an unexplainable mockery of all that was holy. The unhallowed scene was far worse to Mark's senses than the rush of cold air was. In the ensuing few seconds, Mark's idea of good and evil took on new definitions. Atrociously dripping from the ceiling were pools of blood that clung upside down and rained over the bed where Buck was lying. He was partially sitting up with his head tilted slightly toward the nasty serum massacre above him. Mark shuddered, unable to mentally process this debauchery of mad bloodlust and sheer sadism. Mark could see his arms reaching down from these unnatural ponds of crimson. Buck sat up, his eyes gleaming, his blood drizzled, covering him. He squinted to see, and his blandishment, he spoke directly to Mark. Now that you see, do you believe? Mark stood halfway between the door and the frame, with one foot still in the hallway. Fearful of his life, he refused the answer of this demon child, and backed out of the abysmal room. He closed the door, but furtive whispers had followed. From inside the room, Buck laughed a demonic guffawing and deliberate cackle of horrid vocal accents with such intentional intensity that the stain of his denunciation caused Mark to put his feet in motion. His only concern was to escape this hellish carnal house and its eldritch wickedness. Quickly gathering his belongings while keeping an eye on the hallway, he was convinced he wasn't being followed. Instead of using the front door, he was drawn to the back door for a reason he couldn't explain. In this conscious decision, he felt detached from his body, although he remained self-aware. Mark raced to the back door, which led into a wooded area. He couldn't convince himself to head back to the road. He had an urging inside to conceal himself and to hide out of sight. He hoped his gamble would pay off. As he stepped through the door into the outside, he heard Buck's voice scream out maniacally, the dead have gone before us. The dead have gone before us. Although Mark noticed the same imprint of drag marks in the nearly frozen grass, he recognized the need to distance himself from this living nightmare. Into the woods he disappeared with a lantern in his hand full of oil to guide the way. The darkness was indescribable. The light barely pierced through the dark, inky eeriness. As he eked through the wooded area, the trees became more sparse as he walked until he emerged upon a road. He didn't recognize his surroundings whatsoever. Being lost was the least of his worries after the gruesome sight he beheld in the house. There was no explanation. He was thankful to have made it out of there alive. He decided to walk east on the edge of the road and pray to God someone would come by and collect him from this hostile, windy environment. As it began to slightly sleep, Mark, keeping to the road in full forward motion, observed a light in the distance. There was a house. It was far too dark to make out what sort of structure it actually was. As he moved closer, he recognized the place. It was Buck's house. This was hilariously ironic, he thought. Had he gone in a full circle? How in the name of all things righteous and holy could this be? Maybe it was just another ramshackle house that had a similar appearance. After all, he didn't take mental notes of the exterior of Buck's house. He had no other choice but to risk it. The slate was pelting him like needles, and he was frozen to the core. He stepped up the familiar steps, and with hesitation, accompanied by misgivings, he knocked on the door. A female voice from inside called out, Who's there? Can I help you? Mark convinced himself this couldn't be the same house, or if it were, it would have been Buck who would have answered. Oh, sweet Jesus, yes. I'm lost and frozen and have been in a terrible accident. I'm not injured, but I need to escape this weather, Mark pitifully answered. 
The door sang as it opened, with its strained, corroded hinges, creaking a conversant melody of syncopation that pierced Mark's ears almost painfully. The demure face of a beautiful young woman greeted him with a wavering smile of welcome, dressed in a long white sleeping gown. Her crystal blue eyes were unblinking, and she was immune to the cold from the churlish, unforgiving outdoor elements. Please, won't you come in? You must be frozen. Mark did not delay. He needed warmth immediately. He did not find it inside the house, however, for it was identical to Buck's house. Lit with candles and lanterns, and as cold as the grave, he realized he'd stepped back inside the sinister chamber of horrors. I am Edith, she politely said with a mischievously distinguished smile. Mark wondered, should I say anything about Buck? Did she know that I was in the house earlier and bore witness to her demonic brother in some sort of satanic ritual? He opted not to share his name and hold out to daylight before attempting an escape. We would die in this unfavorable weather. Ida seemed genial and pleasant enough, so without invitation, Mark sat on the very sofa he'd attempted to sleep earlier. Can I get you something to eat or drink, she said pliantly. No, thank you. Just shelter. I only need to warm myself, Mark answered, being somewhat confounded at his own loss of appetite. He sensed another presence, and his heart thumped three quick succession poundings. His acute fear was somewhat relieved when he felt the rubbing of the cat against his ankle. Reassured somewhat, he rubbed the soft fur and it began to purr. This is familiar. She's a good cat. He just shared. Mark almost said, I know but remembered he needed to play it cool as if he had never been there before. Would you have the time? Mark had no clue what time of night it was. Time? Edith suddenly appeared incoherent, which raised Mark's alarm bells. She didn't answer. Mark decided to stick his neck out and ask, Do you live here alone? Her face twisted somewhat uncertain and, in Mark's view, somewhat conjectural. As if fragments of memory were being fed into her head by an invisible force, she answered, I, I live here with my brother. Her tone was deadened as a gloom overtook the room. At that point, Mark understood they were not alone. Something unseen had seized the room and influenced Edith, removing the graduations of her mind and causing her to stand statuesque, expressionless, dulled, and fragile. Mark didn't see Buck, but as his imagination ran wild, feeding on the scraps of limited knowledge and the obvious, with great circumspect, he kept his eyes peeled as to not be taken off guard. Ida spoke much differently now. Gone was her innocent and vulnerable bashfulness. What she said next haunted Mark's soul. Death is summoned easily. Why would you say such a thing, Mark asked still clutching a small luggage piece in his hand. Well, I was referring to if you had remained outside in the storm, she answered. She added, You can stay here for the night if you wish. I, I would strongly advise it. Then may I use your toilet? Mark needed to make sure Buck was no longer in the house. For some unknown reason, he didn't feel Edith was a threat, but that boy Buck, he might be the evil devil incarnate. Holding a candle, Edith led Mark down the hallway past the door where he had encountered Buck, lost in macabre extravagance. In another door, further on the opposite side of the hallway, was a toilet. We have uh, no electricity, as you can see. The storm is responsible, but the toilet flushes, she said, looking steadily into his eyes as if to read his mind. Her voice was colorless with no defining character. Mark broke the gaze and said, Okay, then. I'll be right out. Edith's intentions were not known, but her methods were efficacious in that she was successful in causing a disconnect in Mark's thoughts to the point he wondered if any of this was real. He still had his power of observation, though he had lost faith in himself. He had little confidence because the idea of this house and its occupants were incomprehensible. Mark had no need to use the toilet. He merely needed to separate himself from Edith. He tried to bolster up his courage, for he felt deep down a crisis was imminent. 
Soon he would be immersed in terror-stricken fright of unsurmountable proportions and volume. As of this moment, the majority of his ambivalence was the in invisible assailants he had invented himself. He found himself deeply steeped in inexplicable, self-generated, stifling fear. Is everything okay in there? Edith encountered with concern attached to her question. If there was only a window, he challenged himself against the frozen night. He fought back his emotions and blurted out, though from an undulation of a wounded cry, Yes, one minute, one minute, please. Mark collected himself, got his nerves together the best he could, and stepped out into the hallway. Did you flush? She unexpectedly asked with sententious overtones, as if he'd been accused of an indictable offense. Mark hurried back into the bathroom and flushed the toilet obediently. When he entered the hallway, Edith's countenance had become an infernal shade of infinite sorrow. Just when Mark thought he'd recovered himself and was able to be more recumbent with this seemingly endless dire situation, Edith just had to go and appear as some malfeasant emanation of unearthly dread. Mark could not bear much more. Puerile and absurd, she flippantly asked, Do you believe in ghosts? Offended, Mark responded, well, What sort of question is that? I do, she said, with a vulgar, frivolous gesture of the hand. I believe what I see, Mark answered. Do you believe that nightmares are real? She asked mockishly. Please, I, I don't know what you mean. Mark was confused, with the fog permeating in his already clouded mind. Mark, can you hear me? Mark heard Buck's voice, but it was somehow in his own head. Edith asked, Are you afraid of monsters? Banality and despair drifted through to the ether of his soul. There was a sudden amalgamation, the uniting of something inside of him, with something that seemed distant that was now looming over him. Mark could not concentrate. He saw Edith before him in an imbecilic exhibition, twirling and smiling and spinning and laughing. Help me with this, Buck's voice necessitated in Mark's head. Mark heard the trill of many voices gibbering, but only saw Edith in some pathetic display of ridiculous improv dance. Mark found himself dragging something. He was unaware of how this heavy bag came into his tightened grip. He pulled with all of his might. Why was he pulling this bag? His thoughts were scrambled, and he was astounded with terror. He was on the grass, dragging a weighted sack toward the wooded area out back. Pull harder! Pull harder! Buck said as he backed into the thickets. It was a titanic mission, but he had managed the mysterious bag, and now he stood over it. What was it? What could it be? What was in the bag? He glanced around, and this was when he saw an open grave to his right. He was nearly on the edge of the damnable thing. Buck's voice spoke again. Put the bag in the hole. Mark refused. This was outrageous, phenomenally unthinkable. He didn't know what was in the bag. He frantically began to tear at the ties which bound it close. Under the copse of trees in frigid, relentless weather, standing next to a grave, Mark ripped the ties off and prowled into the bag as if he'd found treasure. But what he had discovered was no treasure. He found Ma and Pa charred, burnt to a crisp. It was his own Ma and Pa. Edith was heard laughing and scolding. Look what you did, you freak. You've killed them. How are we going to live? Mark felt the essence of who he was drifting away. Thoughts raced into his mind, pushing Mark Sweeney out and making him extinct. Every memory of Mark faded, and Buck's mind commenced to take hold in great and wondrous details. Mark fought back with what little he had remaining. He sprinted from the gravesite into the woods and ran like the devil until he was standing once again on the porch of the same haunted house. He didn't knock this time. He barged in maddingly and went straight down the hallway. He burst through Buck's door. The room was empty. He went to the next room, which was Edith's bedroom. 
and in a violent rage, he crashed through, leaving the door off its hinges and splintered. He was fed up. This deception had gone on long enough. Uncharacteristically, Mark screamed out an injunction. Show yourselves! Where are you? There was no answer. Mark stormed from the room straight to the last bedroom, which had been said to be the parents' bedroom. He froze at the door, knowing this was it. He had no more options and nothing to lose. Taking in a deep, stale breath, he exhaled slowly. And without resistance, he swung open the door. His eyes could not believe this perverse abomination before him. Buck was standing naked on the bed over his bound parents and was pouring what smelled like gasoline over their bound bodies. The odor of benzene engulfed the room. The parents were still. Mark assumed he had already murdered them. Edith stood to the side of the bed with a large lit candle in her hands. She had a fierce fire in her eyes and ignored Mark altogether. She sighed something aloud. If only darkness had taken that night away. May it not appear among the days of the year. May it never be entered in any of the months. Behold, may that night be barren. May no joyful voice come into it. May it be cursed by those who curse the day. Those prepared to rouse Leviathan. May its morning stars go dark. May it wait in vain for daylight. May it not see the breaking of dawn. For that night did not shut the doors of the womb to hide the sorrow from my eyes. Buck turned his blood-soaked body toward Mark and said, You're not the one. Yowling as if he were in great pain, the demented boy leaped from the bed and charged Mark, shoving him with terrific force from the room and slamming the door with a loud lock of the key. Mark had been pushed to the floor and was now viewing the room under the slight crack at the bottom of the door. Flames lit with a whoosh sound, and Mark could see the bed had been set ablaze. Living to his feet, he touched the doorknob with his hand. The heat had already made the knob impossible to grip. Mark ran again, this time not through the kitchen, out the back, but straight out the front door. He'd witnessed the most unfathomable experience, the deplorable, the unbelievable. As he fled the ghastly house and its devilish illusions, the sun was coming up over the horizon. When the sun lit his face, he never felt more alive. He continued to run until he heard the sound of a vehicle approaching behind him. He stopped and waved his arms, hoping the driver would stop and give him a lift. The heavy oppression he'd been afflicted with had lifted, and he was as light as a feather. The van slowed and then pulled over to the side of the road. It was an older couple, from what he could see. It stopped right before reaching him, and he approached with jubilation. He went to the passenger side, where a couple in their fifties sat smiling at him. You uh, need a ride, fella? The man seemed friendly enough. Yes, please. I've been through a horrendous ordeal, and haven't slept all night, Mark said, thankfully. We just live up the road. You can use our phone up there to get yourself help and be on your way. The man said again. Gracious enough. Slide the door open and get in. The door sticks a little, so yank it hard, the woman advised. Mark took the handle by his hand and gave the door an aggressive pull. The door was difficult, but sprung open. Because of the van's tinted windows, the occupants sitting in the back seat had not been noticed by Mark. Before his bedazzled eyes sat Buck and Edith, grinning with wide-stretched, unnaturally-shaped mouths, there were more like slits across their face. You kids get over and give this man some room, the mom said, staring straight ahead. Do you believe in ghosts now, Mark? Edith asked. Buck moved over for Mark and said, Once you're a ghost, you can't go back. Can you, Pa? The driver never turned around. He simply replied, That's right, son. Dead is dead. Mark climbed into the van and slid the door shut. Familiars leapt onto his lap and purred quietly. Listen for a moment. Before we get on with the program, I just want to ask if you can hear something else. Have you caught it? If not, 
Maybe turn down the lights a little more? Turn up the sound? Take heed of the terrors of I Hear Fear. Host Carrie Mulligan wants you to hear stories of a truly disturbing bent. Stories that are too strange, too implausible to be true, but are based in fact. Like the forest monster that lures teens into its depths, never wanting to let them go. Or the dark side of beauty products that promise youthful vigor, but delivers something else. Or the EDM party, where the DJ brought about deadly consequences. After finishing up here, take a little trip over to Wondery and see what depths I hear fear can take you. I guarantee you'll have a fine old time. Follow I Hear Fear on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge all episodes of I Hear Fear ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. I hope you enjoyed Dead is Dead by Dale Thompson, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Thompson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. You've heard him here many times before, and he's more than happy to continue supplying the chills. As long as you pay him a visit at his official Dale Thompson YouTube channel. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Well, he won a getaway of sorts. Doesn't look like he's going to be leaving anytime soon either, but don't fret. I hear there's a good consolation prize for those stuck in limbo. I just hope he read the fine print. Some people are just born into the roles they have. I, for one, was always meant to give you a nice batch of frights, whether here or announcing the newest sponsor in halftime. But some people can just read others so well. Take our doctor in the next story, who has an uncanny way of talking with the patients in this place until it becomes clear that he can't fix everybody. Without further ado, I present to you One Day... Melton was making his rounds through the old facility, which housed the lunatics and those who were deemed too dangerous or unstable for the community. In this psychiatric hospital, this lunatic asylum, this mental institution, or as others endearingly called it, the sanitarium, Milton was seeing its service recipients one by one. Milton had no office, just his clipboard and notebook well-sharpened number two pencil, not to mention a stethoscope. These irreclaimable, involuntary, committed, ill-behaved patients with their diagnosis of borderline personality disorders, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, PTSD and depression, and not limited to substance use disorders, were all housed neatly together collectively in this infrastructure organization designed to not only keep the residents of the facility situated in a controlled environment, but also to keep the confined from making their way into society, where disturbances would certainly transpire due to the torrential, irrepressible loss of control which would occur if the patients failed to take their medicine on time. Ungoverned and unmonitored, those who lacked the ability of consistent rational thinking had proven they were unable to coexist with the public at large. This was the very reason that within Comfort House, people inside regained a part of humanity that was lost to them on the outside, thus bringing a sense of virtue, ethics, and morality back into their lives. Religion and spiritual beliefs were not encouraged as much as the science of getting well in an environment designed to bridle the behavior and bring a sense of compassion empathy and altruism into their lives. A placard was posted on the wall of the recreation hall, which was a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. It read, Every person must decide at some point whether they'll walk in the light of creative altruism or the darkness of destructive selfishness. Milton approached the residents of Comfort House, 
with a soft touch, a kind manner, and an ease that was never obtrusive, pushy, or aggressive, with a stethoscope dangling from around his neck. He'd studied the patients and understood their habitual quirks and their severe mannerisms, knowing that each personality was different. Some were excessive and severe. Everything to them was exaggerated to the point of madness. This is where the pills came in. One pill to sleep, one pill to wake, one pill to eat, one pill to digest the food, and one pill to defecate. Without the lovely treatments, maniacal lunacy would be the prevailing doctrine, and these characters would show the appalling inhuman side of themselves, and this was never pretty. The pills kept everyone tranquil, steady, controlled. Moderate and managed approaches curved the possible menace of behavioral outbreak because without the treatment, malevolence would be unstoppable. Milton kindly sat in front of Harold, a patient that, even with the medicines, was unable to harness his utterances and force back guttural sounds. So he would sit with these tics, earning him the appellation of Noise Boy. No one but Milton called him Harold. He was simply noise boy to everyone, including the staff. How are you today? Milton leaned in toward Harold, who refused to make eye contact. Better today, better today. Harold repeated, twisting his arms up to his chest and round his body, as if he were shielding him. What happened yesterday? Milton licked the tip of his pencil and prepared to jot down some notes. Yesterday I saw them. Harold was sounding out his words with hard enunciation. Was it the shadow people? Milton asked as he pressed the pencil to paper. Yes. They gave me the impression that my time was short. Harold seemed thought-stricken, frozen upon saying those words. Those four words. My time is short. I agree with your sentiment that time is short, but Harold, time on earth is short for everyone. This life is ephemeral, momentary, fleeting even, so don't believe your view of life is any different than the rest of us. We're in the evanescence life cycle. We're the fugitives, fleeing one place to occupy another space elsewhere when this life ends. Don't believe in the finality of life. Think of your life as a transition greater than yourself, and once you gain a comprehensive grasp on your own importance, You'll see, the shadow people are not there to harm you, but to help you, to guide and direct you. Milton stood and patted Harold on his shoulder, as Harold looked up at him with hopeful eyes. All better now? Milton asked. Yes, better. Harold answered as he looked away again, as if a dream had caught his attention and he wanted to absorb it, remember it before it scurried away out of thought. Milton left Harold in his reverie and focused his attention on a little old lady whose gossamer threaded hoary head practically shined under the illumination where she sat, content in her wheelchair. Margaret, how are we today? Milton asked as he sat across from her at the table where she'd been knitting. With an avaricious move, she snatched her knitting off the table as if Milton had unscrupulous intent. Mine, she sheltered the creation of fabric as if through some inglorious act Milton was interested in robbing her. Oh, no, Margaret, I'm not here because I want to take anything from you. I know the knitting belongs to you. I can make no claim on it, Milton reassured her. With a simpering smile, Margaret eased the fabric back onto the table. The significance of her submission was a real breakthrough, and Milton knew it. Just the day before... She found such comfort and relevancy in her work that she hoarded it against herself and never let her go. This craft was substance to her soul, a significant effort on her part to stay connected with the life she had before being brought to the institution. Margaret had been remanded here many years ago after bludgeoning her husband and young son to death in a fit of uncontrolled, accelerated rage. The judge admitted that Margaret had snapped but he also deemed her not fit for normal prison life due to her diminished capacity to understand right and wrong. Would you like to touch it? Margaret lightly placed her hand on the fabric and gave it a nudge toward Milton, who saw this munificent gesture as a sign of real progress. He made a note of it, but refused to touch the fabric. 
It's okay. It won't bite you. Feel how soft. Margaret encouraged him again. But Milton wanted to stick to his protocol and convictions and didn't want to jinx this significant breakthrough. He wrote down some comprehensive notes, thanked her for the offer, and said, I think it's important that you finish the piece before allowing people to touch it. Keep it pure and consequent. Once it's finished, you can show it off to everyone. Margaret seemed to reason his advice. Do you know what it is going to be when it's finished? she asked. Milton looked at the piece. In all reality, he had no idea. If it were a hat, it was malformed. If a top, it had no arms. He had no clue because it was unremarkable and material. Yet he guessed anyway to appease her. Is it going to be a dress? Sparity dimmed her eyes, and Milton believed he had misspoken, and something sorely imminent was coming. Margaret imparted a smile and said, without descanting or illustration, Heavens, man, you called yourself a doctor? She then uttered something unintelligible under her breath, which to Milton sounded like the word amateur, but he couldn't be sure. It's going to be a medicinal robe, you know, for protection against the nightmares. I've been in fear, like being trapped in a catalepsy of a nightmare. It's been the most unpleasant of times for me. I'm tired of wrestling with it. I'm too old, and it's too difficult, and I'm losing sleep to this foul incubus. Oh, sorry to hear about this. Is it possible a drug such as benzodiazepine or melatonin could be prescribed to aid you in your sleep? Milton wrote down the word sleep apnea next to her name. I was given Ambien, but that only made it worse. Firstly, it made my skin crawl. We called it formication. Secondly, I was sleepwalking. My body burned, it itched, and my legs were numb. I don't do well with sleep aids, and when that incubus comes, I need to be wide awake. He's taken a fancy to me, and I can only imagine what he really wants. Milton assured her he would procure her something that would help her with all of that. He called it a medicinal cocktail, an elixir just for her. He left her sitting with her craft, and as he walked away from her, something in the background became turbulent and disordered. A torrent of confusion ensued, followed by robust laughter, followed by the tumultuous slamming of chairs and the breaking of glass. The deluge of sound swept over him like a flood, and people began screaming and running. This is when Milton saw Lewis standing, holding a long shard of glass. Blood was guttering down his forearm and onto the floor. Lewis was a large, middle-aged man, wild-eyed and trembling, incapable of gaining his right mind. Don't you hear him? He raised his voice. By this time, two security officers had arrived, but stopped in their tracks, when Lewis's lips curled up like a wild beast and he swore loudly. Come any closer and I'll cut your freaking heads off. Two nurses entered behind them, but seemed just as perplexed waiting for security to act. It was at this time Brownie, an 80-year-old schizophrenic who had been sitting at the piano, began her recital of she'll be coming round the mountain. This melody seemed to incite others to become more aggressive. Brownie seemed thrilled to the marrow with the intention. Meanwhile, Lewis was unstrung with capsized memories of his past. Brooding and disagreeable, he stomped his foot as if he had the power to cause the earth to quake. When this didn't happen, he tilted his head back as if he may be doing something permanent to himself. There were shrieks as the room became even more charged with electricity. Every eye, with the exception of Brownie's, was riveted on the scene. She'd comforted her herself through a short-lived musical quest when it was shut down by one of the nurses who thought she was about to incite a full-blown riot. The facility had just come out of a three-week lockdown after a similar incident. Now, with the accelerated yammerings, inextinguishable mutterings, and the ceaseless gibbering, Milton could hardly hear himself think. Milton recognized immediately that neither of these barely post security guards I had the proper training to deal with such an explosive situation. They were obviously out of their league, intimidated and insufficiently capable to tackle such a predicament. What a mess, he thought. What a horrific power. 
Milton took a bold step forward and addressed Lewis. He didn't believe that Lewis was an evil man, for he knew he could be reasonable, yet the acts that had put him in this zoo had been dark and evil. He came from a tainted pedigree, whore of a mother and a petty thief for a father. I hear them too, Lewis. They do exist, in your head and in my head. Are they telling us the same things? It is indiscernible, confusing, indefinable even, but I don't believe they're telling us to hurt anyone or ourselves. Do you? Milton had hoped he had conveyed the right words to defuse this time bomb. Something in Lewis yielded, and he became complacent and brushed his long bangs back off his receding hairline. He appeared as a man inebriated, but Milton knew there was no way he could have gained access to alcohol. What are the voices saying to you? Maybe it is different because the creatures are not the same as the ones I hear, Lewis asked. With some exertion, Milton had to think fast. He wasn't hearing voices at all, and the intricacies of these negotiations were delicate, to say the least. Any impetuous reply may cause harm to Lewis and others. Milton had really stepped in it now. After contemplating, Milton said, They've told me they've made a mistake. A mistake? I know what they're telling me. I still hear them harping in my ears. It hurts. It's painful. Tell them to stop. Lewis sneered as he was surely becoming more vulnerable. What are they saying to you? Milton saw the scene as becoming more ubiquitous by the moment because Lewis had begun pacing like an animal in a cage. My head! My head! Lewis screamed at the floor, his body language showing signs of great, unmanageable stress. What are they telling you, Lewis? Milton sounded like he was pleading with him. Everyone else in the room stood helpless to step in. Most were mortified, and the two security officers were simply observing. Lewis was approaching the primal urge to go to the next level, and Milton could see it. They're telling me to take as many people with me as possible, Lewis revealed. Take them where? Milton asked, trying not to sound smart. Things had redlined very quickly. There was annoying chatter in the background. People were becoming restless. This volatile situation was ready to erupt. In his dissemination, as his emotions spread like a plague, Lewis answered, Out there! I'll take them out there! With me! Out there! Lewis, listen to me. There is no out there. There is only in here where you're safe. You are safe in here. Out there is dangerous. You're protected and cared for in here. You don't want to go out there. The voices you hear are not your friends. They're a distraction stopping you from happiness and fulfillment. Lewis seemed to have gained his composure. He said, happiness, yes, happiness. He placed the shard of glass on the table. This is when security, along with the two nurses and a doctor, broke in and led Lewis out of the recreation hall. That was a close one. A little voice of a man was heard standing beside Milton. Oh, Gary, you're next on my list to see. Do you have a minute? Milton asked as everyone from his last episode faded into memory, and the day continued on. Have you been? I have a report that angels are still visiting you at night. Milton looked down at a blank sheet of paper. At the top of the page, he penciled Gary in big, bold letters. Well, not just angels. Listen to this. Something stupendous happened last night. I've been wanting to share it with someone. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Who sure it looked like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone. But now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills. Like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just $15 a month. What could you do with the money you save with a wireless plan that isn't getting hammered with overages and hidden fees? I know what I could do. 
get onto an actual roller coaster and have some fun. But seriously, folks, I think it would be difficult to find a better deal than this. I mean, unlimited talk, unlimited text, high-speed data on the largest 5G network in the nation, all on plans starting at $15 a month. And even better, keep your phone, keep your number, keep all your contacts. With nothing to lose, why not start making those gains? To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. I was reluctant to say anything, but this is a big, real big deal. It's to be disbelieved, but I have to believe it because I lived it. Gary was a little man, balding terribly and unhealthily thin. His mouth was such that when he talked, it was fish-like with protruding lips. A man could be banished for what I'm about to tell you, even excommunicated. It has to do with the church. Gary's character was becoming more enthralled and animated as he spoke. You remember I am studiously devoted to my religion. Gary then made the sign of the cross. Forgive my build-up, but this is big, he announced. Gary, you've known me a very long time. You know you can share anything with me you feel you need to say. Melton frowned, for as he said this, the tip of his pencil broke, leaving a jagged tip of graphite. Excuse me one moment while I sharpen my pencil, Melton said. He darted quickly across the room and in a desk drawer where most office supplies were kept, minus razors, scissors, and sharp things, he found a love sharpener and quickly restored the tip. He returned to Gary, who looked like an abscess busting to burst. Once Gary saw Melton was comfortably in front of him, he wasted no time. Judas! Milton paused to understand what Gary meant, then asked, What about Judas? I assume we're talking about the disciple from the Bible? Yes. Judas had an important nature. He was not a deceiver. He was a pleaser. Gary waited for Milton, but Milton listened without a word. Judas was only following instructions. Judas was told by Jesus at the Last Supper, What you must do, do it quickly. Jesus was ordering him to betray him. Judas was commanded to turn Jesus into the authorities. Milton asked, How is it that you came to this revelation? Gary stuck a mingled expression of thoughtfulness and delight. Judas was a friend of Jesus, not an enemy, and I'll tell you why. People believe that the devil, Satan, was an angel that led a rebellion against heaven, and then a war was fought between the angels of God and the fallen angels which followed the devil in his insurrection. That's B.S. Remember Job? Elton read very little of the Bible, but he was vaguely familiar with the story. In the book of Job, God was having counsel with his sons of God. And who showed up at the meeting? Before Milton could answer, Gary jumped ahead. It was Satan. Satan was there with the sons of God for the meeting. If he were really a fallen angel, as some propose, how is it he got an invite to return to heaven, stand before God, and actually dialogue? I'll tell you, he was never an angel to begin with. He masquerades as an angel, but in fact, angel or not, he's an agent of God. God makes it rain on the just and the unjust. God created good and evil, light and darkness. So darkness is there to show us how brilliant the light is, and in turn, we see God more clearly. Judas, though he betrayed Jesus, was an agent of God doing God's will. Without Judas, there would have been no Jesus, Savior of the world. Milton had a question. So, you're saying Satan and Judas are mere agents of God to cause trouble, but out of this trouble comes good? Exactly. I won't bore you with other conclusions I've recently come to, but I have enough to fill a book. I ascertain this to be truth. There's no other conclusion to be drawn. Gary looked like he knew it, 
It was hard to believe, but he seemed certain. Sounds like quite the rigmarole to resolve. But you're the expert, not I. I must concur with you on this. and Take a note to look into it further. Milton promised. If you do study it, it's a real labyrinth. It'll take your breath away like a queer ass, Gary mentioned. Milton didn't know what a queer ass was, but later he'd look the word up to find that it meant artificial ventilator that forces air in and out of the lungs. I'm reluctant to leave you so soon. I found your insight enlightening. Maybe we can speak more on this tomorrow. I must finish my rounds. Milton informed him. Milton located Jim Morrow, who was the polar opposite of Gary. Jim despised God. He was angry, full of animosity. He was an omen in itself, an omen of great portent, and had a security officer near him at all times. Many thought Lewis, who had the episode earlier with the broken glass, was dangerous. But in contrast, Jim's hallmark was not apathy. He was a man with no impulse control. He was a murderer, but for reason of insanity. He never spent a day in prison. He somehow managed to get himself declared insane for life. Jim was sitting alone, as usual, rocking back and forth in front of the TV. He couldn't tell you what was on the screen, but he never changed channels and allowed anyone else to change the channels. Milton sat in the chair beside him. Jim, how are you today? Jim grunted annoyingly, his frog-like neck swollen noticeably. Anything on your mind today? Anything you'd like to share? Milton watched Jim's eyes as a portent to see if he was stepping over the invisible line that might set Jim off. And characteristically, Jim said, The pills. The pills. They don't keep us alive. They're killing us. Elton saw that something was bearing on Jim's mind and that this oppressive weight had dulled him. It was an elevation of a malady, an acute body illness, that Jim struggled with, combined with peculiar sensibilities of temperament, intermingled with being prone to murder, Milton felt a bit uneasy conducting this interview. My heart sickened, Jim stated with overtones of abandonment and unredeemable value. Well, that's not good to hear. Just yesterday I thought we had made some progress, stated Milton. Yesterday's yesterday, that's the past. I'm talking about now, right now, he emphasized. Ridiculous. What could have changed in 24 hours? Milton remarkably found the courage to ask. Jim was never superficial or manipulative. Whatever his demons were, they were consistent. That thing that possessed him had never changed. Neither did Jim until this conversation, when his nature seemed to have become more reflective. In Milton's eyes, he saw a man deteriorating in front of him. Jim looked like a prisoner who overnight had become somehow decrepit with a fractured spirit and something tiny left of his manhood was wriggling to escape. The gap was closing in. Milton was more than astonished. Jim was shattered like a man that had been mentally penetrated, someone who was the butt of a despicable rumor and scorned. He appeared soft, boneless, and insufferable man, skulking behind a brawny frame. The animosity he strongly had shown in the past was not even a trickle. This once necrophiliac seemed unaroused, malformed. Milton couldn't wrap his mind around how the most notorious guest of the facility was no longer accessible and had been replaced by this shell of a man. Night terrors come to me. A black gummed hag with an icy touch, Jim cringed and moaned. I'm not just cursed, I'm damned. Jim, tell me what has happened. Milton was troubled and generally concerned for Jim's mental state. It wasn't until this point that Jim pulled his hands out of his pockets to reveal the crimson stains of what appeared to be dried blood. Milton leaped up. He knew it was the wrong thing to do, but the flight instincts kicked in, and he retreated for safety. What unearthly thing have you done? Milton asked. I'm prone to it, they tell me, Jim said justifying whatever evil he had yet to admit to. Milton was stifled with gloom, wanting to call for help, but he had to first catch his breath. 
She insulted me. She said I was indiscriminately affectionate and had involuntary impulses. These were relevant facts, most likely, but Milton had stopped taking notes. Jim gestured for Milton to take a seat, and Milton didn't argue. Still with words knotted in his throat, Milton managed to ask, Who is she? What have you done? Jim rocked back and forth in his seat with nervous agitation. The slender man caused me to do it. I'd never seen him before. I always knew there was something watching me. Then last night, he stepped out of the shadows. These pills make me feel nothing. I'm tormented. This is why I've acted out. Who is it? Where is she? Milton asked, recognizing the agony upon Jim's face. It was Nancy, Nurse Nancy. She's under my bed, Jim admitted. Milton was impaled with the sickness right in the pit of his gut as this permeating nightmare began to unfold. He was as disgusted by Jim's loathsomeness as he was about hearing about Nancy's death. He'd always liked Nancy. She was a new mother. Show me, Milton said. Jim stood without a word, with slumped shoulders, and obediently led the way out of the recreational center down the hallway to his room. His door was closed. Milton held up his hand to indicate for Jim to remain in the hallway. Jim complied. Jim did not quarrel, from what Milton could ascertain. All of Jim's fight had been left inside his room. Milton entered, and it was as Jim said, except much worse. The bloodstains were everywhere. There would be no need for investigators to use luminol. It was obvious this was a crime scene. Milton had only stepped into the room, and not wanting to disturb or contaminate the crime scene, he backed out into the hallway and checked his both shoes for blood. Luckily, there were no signs. He stooped down and saw the headless torso of Nancy. Beneath the bed, lifeless, the ichor had drained from her broken skin. Jim, it is not good, my friend. You've crossed the line with this one, Milton calmly said. No one is immortal, Jim weirdly remarked. Even ah, more odd, Milton agreed. Where's her head, Jim? What have you done with the head? Milton thought how ridiculous that sounded. Never in his life would he ever have imagined that he would be asking a serial killer face to face where was the head of his last victim? Jim took a look into the room as if he had no idea what I was talking about. Her head? No way, man, that wasn't me. He professed with eradicable conviction. This was a monstrous mess. Milton had no choice but to proceed. He settled Jim at the main nurse's station and explained to the head of the department what Jim had confessed to and what he had uncovered in light of being taken to the scene of the murder. Milton felt his heart going crazy in some sort of arrhythmic discord, as if he were the guilty party. But this was because Milton had not taken his meds on this day. Because of the seriousness of the crime, the acts of lasciviousness, and murder, Jim would be leaving their facility, and Milton would have to relinquish the stethoscope he'd acquired without approval. Milton was an omnivorous patient of the facility himself, who made his rounds daily masquerading as a doctor. Patients were used to him playing doctor and treated him with more respect and leaned upon his expertise, advice, and diagnosis more than they did the nurses and counselors who actually operated the facility. It would be a few weeks before Milton was allowed a stethoscope, a pad of paper and a pencil because of the severity of Jim's heinous crime. Milton was placed back on his regular medication and was happy to draft a report each day. Milton could put his mask back on after the investigation had concluded and was allowed to practice his unsanctioned rounds throughout Comfort House as long as, at the end of each day, he gave his report to the head nurse and turned in his stethoscope. It was understood by the staff that Milton was trusted by the residents and he often found out more about what they may be going on in their minds but mentally disturbed than the staff could. Milton had a way of taking the distortions and psychotic dreams that came to him in formless animated tales from the other patients and writing them on paper in such an uncontaminated way that the nurses could gain incredible insight. The writings 
magnified what was too infinitesimal for the staff to see. They seemed to see things through the wrong end of the telescope. The deranged was not always outwardly crazy, and the crazies were not all introverts. Milton made sure his reports reflected the distinction. And concerning the missing head of Nancy the nurse, that is an unresolved mystery still. I hope you enjoyed One Day by Dale Thompson as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Thompson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. And when you have a moment, we'd like to remind you one last time that he has an official YouTube page under his name, Thompson. That's T-H... Well, hopefully you caught me spelling it the last time. Thanks again for your support of this show and tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month to get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. (laughs) Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. 
If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>